All right, we'll see if we're live. And if we are, I'll just hang out here and wait until YouTube gets its act together, until we all see each other. All right, all right. Let me just pop in here, tell everybody live now. There we go, there we go. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, oh, shoot, you're way up there. <laughs> okay, I thought something was amiss. There we go, there we go. Just, oh, perfect, perfect. Sound level's looking good. I'm getting into the yellow. Yellow's what you like to see. Perfect, my computer is muted. There we go, perfect, perfect. All right, all right. I'm gonna shoot the S for a little bit. We'll wait to see uh, who piles in, what happens. I'm gonna send a little test message here. Again here, here we go. And there we go. There we go. So for posterity, um, I am going to wait a little bit. So I guess I'll, I'll I'll BS a little bit as to why I even started doing this homestead thing in the first place. Um, typically, people did homesteads for aesthetic reasons, lifestyle reasons even back in like the 60s and stuff. The homesteading thing came back into vogue a little bit after Little House in the Prairie was airing on television and after the hippies decided they all wanted to go back to nature. You'll notice there's a lot of hippie influence on homesteading now, which is why a lot of homesteading is more about, I don't know, spiritual realignment, aesthetics, um, being one with nature, being self-sufficient, being environmentally sound. But around 2020, you know, the magical month of June 2020, something changed. <clears throat> Pardon me, I got a post nasal drip from hell. Something changed in June 2020, and that was the supply chain started to bind up. You'll notice that all the commodity goods started increasing in price at a massive rate. They came down a little bit about six months ago, and they've kind of plateaued, and they're not really sure where they're going to go from there. But what this meant was that meat grains, vegetables, all that stuff that you're paying way more in the grocery store for now, you know, 50 to 80% or 100% or 300% more, um, people started finding an economic reason to homestead. So instead of having like a bunch of hippies who decided that it's good for the environment to live on the land, now you have people who work from home, right? Work from home is a big part of this phenomenon. That's, that's why I did it. I, I used to be a salesman. Um, I used to be a field applications engineer uh, and would travel all over the country. I didn't really have a home base. I didn't need one. I lived in Maryland and Maryland has like a two and a half percent, three percent state tax on top of a, whatever the local tax is, which for me was two and a half percent. So I was paying another five and a half percent taxes on top of my federal, which was 20. So I was pretty much paying 25% more taxes than I needed to. Um, for services that were not rendered during COVID. I was like, forget it. I don't care about these services. And you know, it's weird moving to Tennessee where there are no state taxes. The roads are so much better here. Like the roads are, are significantly better. The services are better. Like the fire department is like right on the spot. The police department is great. And you can defend yourself with a firearm if you need to. So you don't even have to wait for the cops. If you're in imminent peril and danger, if you feel yourself to be. So all in all work from home made it so that I could be free. Work from home meant that I could shave. Actually, let me put my screen on. You're gonna get a little, little preview of what I'm gonna talk about tonight, but I like to put up the calculator because I'm a huge nerd and I love me some math. Math will set you free, my friend. Let's say I was making $150,000 a year. And that's, that's not like a huge, um, it's not really far off. I was, I was actually making more than that, but let's just say that. That extra 6% 6 was $9,000 I was flushing down the toilet. So you're thinking, ah, oh, 6%, that's not a big deal. That's $9,000. I was paying for for nothing. I was paying for inferior roads. I was paying for inferior services. I, I, I have a gallbladder that I had to remove, um, most likely because of the water supply, because I was getting my water straight from the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the great and safe and wonderfully run and non-corrupt city of Baltimore was providing my house with tap water. And a few years into drinking Baltimore tap water, I had to have my gallbladder removed. Okay, so I'm paying $9,000 of state taxes and, and local taxes 
for police that take five minutes longer to get there. Okay, so I'm dead already. Uh, a, a, ju a judicial system that will prosecute me to the fullest extent of the law if I defend myself, if I feel that I'm in imminent peril and danger. Okay. Uh, I have fire services that take longer. I have roads that are crappier, like Tennessee roads. If for all those who just piled in, so much better than Maryland roads. You drive on 259, the Baltimore Washington Parkway uh, versus some podunk road out here. It's no different. It's, it's the, the podunk road here is so much better. Like it, it's either that or, you know, you're on gravel in the middle of a country road that's not maintained. But Tennessee, people from Tennessee care about their state. So, you know, that's going to count a lot more. You know, when I see people working on the roadside, it's not like five people standing around looking and then one guy doing work. It's usually almost everybody's working. All right. People want to get stuff done. We live here. We're trying to just get in, do the work, clock out and then conk out. Right. That's what that's the American dream. <laughs> we don't want to just sit around collecting union dues. Anyways, I'm paying nine thousand dollars and work from home. Set me free. OK, work from home. Set me free. I don't have to pay that money anymore. And it was more than 9000 because I was making closer to $200,000 total back then because I was getting commissions, I was getting bonuses. I'm not going to like brag or anything, but that was the conditions I was in. And I was like, my goodness, I'm paying five figures to Maryland right now for, for jack squat. So I moved, to, I moved to Tennessee. The economic uh, headwinds were hitting us. Everything's more expensive. As I, as I showed on my last stream, every commodity that means a damn is 50 to 80% higher than it was in June of 2020. And in some cases, they were 300% higher, although that was like showing from dip to peak, and it was kind of, I was gerrymandering the data a little bit. But the fact that I could even gerrymander it at all to have a 300% increase is insane. Insane. So it used to be just hippies and um, little house in the prairie LARPers who were doing homesteading. And now, in the year of our Lord 2020 through 2023, and probably till 2040, who knows, People are homesteading for economic reasons. All right, what does that mean? Well, that means that I want free meat. GD it. Okay, I'm tired of paying the farmer five, six dollars a pound for beef, and the beef is just eating grass. I don't just, I'll just buy the grass. I'll just own the means of production, as the uh, Marxists say and as the capitalists actually do. By, by the way, capitalism is the only system by which the normal person can own the means of production. All right, so, so there we go. Our, our Marxist future is here. It's just called buy some land, okay? Buy some land and you could take care of yourself. I just, so I just got done measuring all of the meat I harvested. And I'm going to talk about this whole process of harvesting. It was 86.05 pounds of meat, vacuum sealed, frozen. It's good for two years. And it's, it's lamb. Like lamb is expensive. Like, lamb is probably like six, seven, eight. I don't even know how expensive lamb is. I wouldn't opine. If anybody in the comments listening to this wants to Google that for me, I would love to know how much does lamb go for per pound, like on average, right? Because I've got rack of lamb, I have leg of lamb, I got meat cuts, I don't even know what they are. I got neck meat, which is usually used for stocks, that's cheaper meat. Um, I have, um, oh geez, what, what, I forget what they call the, the leg, the upper part of the leg. It's like haunch, it's not haunch, I keep wanting to think haunch, it's like, not husk, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Hawks, there we go, hawks, lamb hawks, that stuff. I've got all of that. I have 86 pounds of meat, vacuum sealed, and all I did was I paid 200 bucks in March for a lamb, and then I just let it eat my grass. There's no maintenance. I got a fenced-in area, and that's about it, right? I got a fenced-in area, and this lamb went from little itty-bitty lamb to full-grown lamb. I'm going to show you how that worked, okay? And to do that, I am going to start with Google Maps because everything starts... Everything comes from the land and everything goes back to the land. So let's look at that land. I'm going to dox myself and I really don't care. You can visit me if you have ill intent. You'll just, uh, I'll just calibrate my sights, iron sights, if you have ill intent. Well, give me, a, give me some shooting practice. Anyways, nah, I wouldn't shoot you. I'd offer you, I'd offer you some fresh lamb, Christian thing. I, have, I, ain't, I haven't the heart to hurt anyone. All right, so here's the land. This is the sheep area. And in this sheep area, I can measure the distance and actually show you how big this area is. So we're going data, okay? We're not making numbers up. We're not messing around. This is how much space the sheep have. Okay. Total The total area is 117,000 square feet. And that's roughly about two and a half acres. But just from my observation, 
The sheep are kind of skittish. They don't use that whole field. They use about this much. And that's five sheep. And they're not nearly eating all of it, right? And this is about 70,000 square feet, according to Google Maps. That means you're looking at about maybe, maybe two acres, a little less than two acres. An acre is about 44,000 square feet. So you need a fenced in area of 44,000 square feet. All right, and then you've got your sheep, let them, and they just eat grass. They're edible lawnmowers. They don't, like I don't need to actually feed them any additives whatsoever. They're, they're called ruminants, I believe. And that means they have multiple stomach cavities. The multiple stomach cavities allow them to digest in stages. So they can have one stage here for just initial grass. It's only been chewed. Like they'll chew their cud. Um, as, the, as the Bible says, right, if you want to be uh, kosher, you know, cloven hoof and choose their cud. The reason for that is because they have a large, you know, they have a multiple stage digestion tract. Chew their food, chew their cud, break it down. It goes in the first stomach, breaks down, has a certain stage. And then as it breaks down, it starts going into the second stomach where it finally gets to a part where it's converted into sugars, it's converted into the, the nutrients the sheep needs. And, and the sheep is able to sustain itself off of grass. It's the same reason why we can't eat, what well, we cannot eat grass is we don't have this multiple stage production cycle inside of our bodies, right? These sheep have a superpower and that's to become grass to meat converters. They can sustain themselves on that. So these are essentially to me edible lawn mowers and I need that like section of the lawn mowed anyway. So no, no skin off my back, right? Hmm. Right, I need that section of lawn mode. If you have land and it's cleared, you have grass. The grass is free. If you're mowing your grass, that can do a sheep or a cow or a pig or whatever. I don't think pigs can really live off of this, but pigs root around for other things. Um, they usually, usually actually, you keep pigs in forests. They will eat acorns. And uh, if you get a certain special Spanish variety of pig, I forget what kind of meat it becomes. It's like Iberian or something. Anyway, some really fancy uh, pork. But that's more of a monetary crop, not really like self-sustaining. So that is the area. Oh, and there's a little barn I have here, but you can use a shed. Like, in fact, sheep actually sleep outside. All right, so it's worth it to talk about fielding sheep. This is the bare minimum you need for sheep, okay? The bare minimum you need for sheep is to have your area enclosed by a fence. You don't even really need electricity. Uh, sheep are not like goats. Uh, goats are like parkour enthusiasts. They want to escape. Sheep don't want to escape. <laughs> Unless they think that on the immediate other side of this fence there is food, they don't want to escape. They're happy just being right where they are. They are the, they've, outside of chickens, they've got to be some of the dumbest creatures I've ever met. Um, they have no attention span. They have no per, like permanence of, of vision or time. Uh, and they completely forget about their familial relations like almost instantly. It's, it's quite a something. So when I took this sheep out, I put him in the shed that's located right here and just left him in there to, uh, to go through his 24 hour period of no food. Like he can have water. I want his system to start clearing out. It wasn't 24 hours was not nearly enough time, by the way, he needed shoot. I'm about to do 48 hours. I mean, it sucks that he won't be eating in that time, but his, his guts were full of stuff. Like he wasn't even close to being purged. I don't know how long it takes for food to actually cycle through their system, but it's gotta take, it's gotta take at least weeks. Like his guts were full. They were bloated. Anyways, just full of grass, full of stuff. Um, yeah, the bare minimum you need is you fence in the area, and it could be a massive area of land. And people will put um, uh, large uh, shepherd dogs. I'm forgetting the name of them right now. It starts with a P. It's not a Pomeranian. That's like a tiny dog, right? Pyrenees. They, they give a Pyrenees sheepdog because the Pyrenees sheepdog, A, looks like a sheep, and the dumb sheep will accept it. B, it will lay with the sheep and actually live with them as family. It'll, it'll, a Pyrenees dog will consider, and I will look up a Pyrenees dog, a Pyrenees dog will consider the sheep herd to be their uh, family. Pyrenees dog, which means, by the way, that it's a wild dog. Like, if you have a sheep dog that's living out a field, there we go, Pyrenees mountain dog. <clears throat> if you have a dog that's living out in the field with your sheep herd, like your, your, your sheep herd, it is a wild dog. If you try to take a sheep from that sheep herd, it will attack you. It will defend uh, that sheep herd as if it was their family. So good luck getting those sheep. I choose not to do that. Um, instead, I just have them live out. But the thing is, they don't even really need a barn. That's why they have wool. They're wearing a really nice wool coat at all times and will just sleep outside. Like they don't need facilities. 
The only time they really need a facility, hey, John Wander, how's it going? The only time they need a facility is to shield them from the wind if it's really cold or if they are giving birth. And even that is like a luxury. Like they don't, um, sheep don't really need a shelter at all. They'll, they'll give birth out in the field. If you want to reduce the fatality rate of birth and the fatality rate of infancy, then yes, you should intervene. That's just good economics, but it's not like an absolute necessity. And an area sm as small as this, like, I mean, this is almost two acres, but two acres is not very much. Like it takes maybe a minute to walk across this. So if it takes a minute to walk across this field, you can go out there and service your sheep. If you notice there's something wrong, uh, I would post a, a wide angle lens camera somewhere around here. And I would just keep an eye on them. Just have a monitor in my house. Like, why not? I plan on doing that next year because I'm tired of going out and checking on them. And it's better to be able to check on them at a glance. So yeah, get a Pyrenees dog. Uh, they don't, you don't have to feed the Pyrenees dog. This is kind of messed up. This is kind of fucked up. But uh, uh, Pyrenees dogs will eat the, the sheep's uh, fecal matter. And that is how they will sustain themselves. I mean, the, the, the thing is the sheep are taking raw grass and raw weeds and uh, sheep will eat anything. So if it's rose bushes, if it's, um, oh yeah, thanks for the tip, man. Hey, thanks, Joey Diener. Awesome. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Holy crap. Yeah, so I paid two dollars and thirty cents, and Joey's over here telling me it's like twenty-two, twenty-three dollars, um, you know, fifteen dollars per pound. So yeah, exactly. Hey, if you want some meat, come over and get it. I don't know if I, <laughs> you know, what's messed up. I don't even know if I like lamb that much. My wife is telling me I'll get used to it and I'll really enjoy it. I've only had it once, and I was like, this tastes a little bit like deer. It's a little, you know, it's got that sort of twinge to it. Um, but I, I think it was good. I think it was good. It's got some stew potential, but you know, screw it. I'll eat, I'll eat whatever you put barbecue sauce on. So, but anyways, these sheep will digest grass, right? And what comes out the other end is there's always something left on the table. There's no such thing as a hundred percent efficient digestive tract. So that stuff that's left over, the dog will eat. And by the way, um, fecal matter also contains blood. Like that's why it's brown, right? That's dark brown, right? And if it's really black, that means you have, might have a internal bleeding. Um, but your body's trying to get rid of dead blood cells. Dead blood cells is protein. So there you go. Now I talked to another neighbor. <laughs> the, the neighbor who told me to do this is like some old Vietnam veteran, like Tennessee, good old, like, uh, I wouldn't say a good old boy. Cause he's not like connected. He's just, he's just like an old fella. He's telling me about how hard it is to shoot birds with his pistol. I'm like, you're just, <laughs> you're just out there like a cowboy, just shooting at birds. And eventually he says, ah, oh, forget it. He was telling me about how he used to sneak up on moles. So he'd walk real gentle, like on the grass. And, and John Wander will probably remember is that I talked about this Vietnam veteran neighbor. He'd, he'd, he'd walk real soft on the grass and then see the little mole hill like raising up and he'd take his pistol out and shoot it. And I'm like, man, this guy's got attention to detail. I'm telling you, the older generation's got a major advantage when it comes to patience. Anyways, he's the one who told me about this uh, using the Pyrenees and the Pyrenees just living off of the, the sheep's fecal matter. And I'm like, that's tempting. My neighbor's son comes over who is old and his own kids and everything. <laughs> And I tell him about this and my neighbor's son is just like, yeah, it's kind of messed up. I leave food out for him. <laughs> I was like, yeah, by the way, if you leave food out for these Pyrenees, dogs are like boys. If you feed them, they'll like you. That's it. Like the fastest way to a dog's heart is through his stomach. I would suggest feeding everything on your farm in as like intimate of a, of a setting as possible, like handing them the food at least a little bit so they're used to you and they associate the food with you or else they'll start attacking you. Cause these animals are literally morons. Like the, the most retarded things you'll ever meet in your life. Like you, you'll put food in a bucket, throw the food out and then it won't really associate it with it. It's just so stupid. And then it'll come over and attack you. It doesn't understand that you just threw food out for it. So you almost have to like feed it out of your hand. Yeah, yeah, we made the mistake with our geese. We let our geese grow up without uh, coddling them enough. And now the geese like will bite you. Although it is pretty funny, it's kind of, it's, it's like getting attacked by a clam, a little goose beak. It just like pinches on you like you're being like someone just took an oyster or a clam or something. Anyways, let's talk about brass tacks, okay? You got your land. You put your sheep there. How do you buy sheep, okay? Let's start with that. This is a website called LSN. It's not necessarily active in your area. Craigslist will be active too. We'll take a look on that as well. LSN, I have no idea what the heck it stands for, right? but it is pretty much Craigslist for farmers. So under the category of all farm and livestock, livestock sheep, here is a one-year-old cotton and ooh, 
uh, two ooze and a ram, 250 bucks a piece. There you go. Two ooze and a ram is all you need to produce anywhere from two. Uh, and, and by the way, sheep often will have twins. So that's two to four lambs a season. Uh, 86 pounds of meat um, is not quite enough for one person for a year if you're a big meat eater, right? But 100 pounds will do it. So then you'll have some surplus. If you cut back a little bit, that's two people's worth. That's 160 pounds of meat uh, per year just from those two lambs. So this is pretty much self-sufficiency. So for 750 bucks, plus however much money it costs to enclose the fence line, I would estimate about a seven, oh, sorry, about $1,000 to $2,000 to enclose that area of fence. So now you're looking about $2,750 investment tops. Bring them over here. You put them in your grassland. You just let them eat the grass. You don't actually have to convince lambs to like you. They just by default like you. I, they're... I don't know if that's bad judgment on their part, but whatever, we'll take advantage of it. However you want to do it. Oh, this is Atlanta, Georgia. Let me let me fix this. I don't know why my, my internet always thinks I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Come on. No, no. Yeah, I'll dox myself. And again, I don't really mind doxing myself. If you want to come visit me, go visit me. I'll either I'll either feed you meat or I'll feed you lead, depending on your disposition. I'm generally pretty pretty gentle. Um there should be livestock. Hey, Eugene, how's it going? My wife loves that name, Eugene. She absolutely loves it. I remember that was a character from Hey Arnold. Well, so what brings you here, Eugene? Yeah, Joey Diener, too. What brings you here? Greetings from New Jersey, man. All right, farm and garden. I'm looking up sheep. By the way, you could. it is a legitimate strategy to just buy a, um, a calf, a cow calf, and just raise it for however long. All right, all right. It's, got, it's still got me around bloody uh, Georgia. Yeah, Monterey, Tennessee, come on. There we go, bada bing, bada boom. All right, out we go. I want to get make sure I get Cookville and Crossville in there. Let's do it. You can get used to it. That's right, especially when it's free, man. Or at least, like the initial... Um, ones you buy are not going to be free and the initial investment for all this infrastructure is not going to be free but if you're breeding them and it's not hard to breed them they just i mean nature uh uh life uh finds a way uh, if you're breeding them it's free after that like it's just all right scottish black by the way um they call the uh meat sheep are called blackface that's oh geez i just, I just realized youtube might not like me saying that they're dorpers, right? Dorpers and other ones tend to be black-faced. I don't know why there's something about the genetics and like growing big and having a black face for sheep. I find that my uh, my sheep, they're, although they're white-faced, they, they do pretty good. Can't argue with 86 pounds of, uh, of weighed meat at the end of it. So we have three rams for sale, dorper mix. All right, so here we go. Craigslist is saying 225 bucks. Uh, dorpers are a good um, meat sheep see there are lists of like best breeds of sheep for milk and the reason why i like sheep okay the reason why i like sheep is they don't need a lot of land and they don't need a lot of care all right this means that you spread your risk out it's better to buy five of one animal than to buy one of one animal if you know what i mean like you don't know if the one animal is going to get sick like you're going to have a certain percent that die out maybe right i was lucky none of mine died i they could have though right they could get an infectious disease uh, they could even get their horns hooked in the fence and then on a hot summer day they dehydrate within two hours that that's a real thing that the that's the reason why you have electric fences actually to keep their uh keep them from getting caught in the fence the fence is actually it, the, the fence is necessary but it's actually one of the biggest hazards they come across because they will get their horns stuck in that fence and they will die especially that guy right there he's, he's a goner if he touches that fence um, it gets caught in there, but yeah, you got, uh, this is for milk sheep and there's a, another one for meat sheep. All right. So you buy these sheep for like 225 up a head, 250 a head. Let's say it's 250 a head. You got, a, a two moms and a dad, lucky dad. Uh, there we go. Meat production. You get your sheep, you get your fencing material, which you can get like four inch by four inch gapped. You can get, um, there's, there's actually fencing at um, Rural King and uh, Tractor Supply. 
that is meant specifically for sheep. Like it's, it'll say like sheep, cow, and goat. Um, reason why you want sheep, they're a lot cheaper than cows, so you can get more of them, so you can spread out your risk. Second off, don't get goats. Everyone, everyone regrets goats. <laughs> As I said, goats are like parkour maniacs. They want to climb. They want to jump. They want to get to places they're not supposed to be, which means that you have to build your place like Fort Knox. So don't get goats. They're just going to give you, and their uh, horns grow in faster and they grow in pointier. Like some uh, sheep varieties don't even have horns or it takes them like five years to grow horns. Like I've got a, a white doll, which is a, like an Alaskan um, wild sheep. It's, it's meant to be hunted down, right? It, it just has little nubs for horns it doesn't have horns yet proper if it it once it gets horns they're going to be huge which at which case i'm going to go out there with a saw and saw them off um but yeah all right so here's here's a bunch of different meat sheep uh this one's called this uh, website's called domestic there you go they're a great source they'll even tell you like how many liters of milk you can expect they're they're great which is why i got a katahdin sheep so let me look at my katahdins there we go I figured I'd have like a milk producing moms and then a meaty dad. So I'd get like a nice milk meat hybrid, but they can fatten up real easy on the heavy milk producing moms. So I get the best of both worlds. 210 liters per two in a 210 day lactation period. So when this sheep gives birth, it's going to produce milk for 210 days at which it's going to average one liter per day. That's, that's some, that's a lot of milk, man. I don't, I can't keep up with that. I'm probably gonna be making cheeses. Um, what was it? Ah, oh, man. Something Romano cheese. That's yeah, the type of Pecorino Romano. That's the one Pecorino Romano. That's the type of cheese. There we go. Yeah. Pecorino. Uh, there is a great uh, cheese maker on YouTube. If you look up though, how to make Pecorino Romano, you're going to find him. He's, he's a, it's like Andrew Weber or something like that. And he does a fantastic set of tour, tutorials. So once you get an, a farm animal, you start getting all this other production, like fallout that comes from it, like meat and milk. If you pick a wooling variety, which I don't suggest, uh, you can also get wool, but again, I don't suggest it because then it's another chore you got to do. You got to go out and, um, like shear it or else they'll overgrow. I got a hair sheep. Hair sheeps don't produce wool. They actually shed like a dog, which means I don't have to go out and take care of them. So this is my Katahdin sheeps, uh, 250 a piece. Enough of that. Fencing, electric fence optional once they start getting horns, right? Let's talk about cutting this bastard up. All right, so I started out with, uh, <laughs> I'm actually gonna view my order. Everything, by the way, all of my equipment has gotten so much more expensive on, on Amazon over the last year. And I'll show you, all right? So I'm going to put view last order. This is a $70 meat saw. It worked really well for me. I don't recommend products unless I've used them myself. Oh, yeah, um, sensitive content. I'm talking about slaughtering sheep today. <laughs> sensitive content warning. This is where your meat comes from. There we go. Yeah, there's, there's, the, there's the saw in action right there. I'm, like, I'm like looking like I got purpose. What I'm doing there is I'm trying not to get this bar caught in the meat. <laughs> anyways all right so here's the saw it cost 70 bucks when i bought it it cost 54 bucks all right actually it's good that i pulled this up this is my uh, i bought a lem products 25 uh, inch meat saw it's great it could be shorter it could be longer 25 inches feels good though um it was 54 when i bought it and now it's 60 it's like 70 bucks now welcome to inflation i know it's Bitch, bitch, moan, moan. What are you going to do? All right. Here's the boning knife that I used. I thought it was good. I thought it was good. It's a Victronics six inch boning knife, semi stiff, whatever that means. I think it's the same one that the bearded butchers, those guys are great on YouTube. Let me give you a little introduction to myself. If you don't already know, I am not an expert on any given thing. I am a dilettante. I actually have no idea what I'm doing as of last week. However, who do you want to learn from more? The person who's been doing it their whole lives or someone who is just like you who's starting out and learning stuff the hard way. And there's a lot of stuff, by the way, the experts don't tell you. Like people who've been slaughtering chickens, slaughtering sheep, doing all this stuff, they're experts on it. They don't remember what it's like to suck at it. I, I remember what it's like to suck at it because that was two weeks ago <laughs> for me, right? So I'm gonna be able to tell you what works and what doesn't. 
Uh, definitely look up uh, look up a tutorial on how to hone a blade. It is a skill, but it'll take you 20 minute YouTube, like 20 minutes of practice and you'll get it. It's all about the angles, but honing your blade's important. This is a boning knife. And if you're gonna go to the boning knife, you can pretty much take all of the flesh off the bone. Like you go in there and just, it, it's like the bone was never there. It's great. And there's like very little meat attached to the bone left. You don't waste a lot. It's great. I love it. I did not end up using these butcher hooks, by the way. Um, I can see how they're useful. They're good for removing membranes. They're also good in a pinch if you need a hook to like grab on something, if you're trying to stay sanitary. Uh, or if the hook is sanitary and your hands are not, like if you touch the hide of the sheep, your, your hands are screwed. You need to wash them or you need to put on some gloves. This hook though can stay clean and you can use it to grip and grab. Uh, you can use it to delaminate skin. Uh, so Eugene, I think I'm getting sheep. All right, all right. I raised two rounds of meat chicken. Oh yeah, meat chickens. That's awesome, man. Good stuff, good stuff. I did meat chickens well, my last year too, right? Nice, yeah, yeah. Okay, Eugene, it is easier. And I think my wife, my wife, by the way, is a vegetarian and she helps me butcher uh, animals because she's a badass and because she supports her husband. And I appreciate that. Um, which means, you know, I'm super happy. This is the best marriage ever. You get, get, your wife, get yourself a wife that supports you and you just feel like a million bucks every day. Uh, get yourself a wife that doesn't support you and uh, woof, woof. Don't want to imagine that, man. Well, well that's how most people live. I, I'm, I'm going to start Manosphere Mondays on uh, next Monday. I had a lot of work to do, especially with the sheep. I had to butcher the... It, I still got his liver in my cooler. I got to go put that away. I've been really busy, but Manosphere Mondays, I'd love to do that next Monday where I give like real advice on relationships, women, men. I feel like half the people in the man, no, actually 99% of the people in the manosphere are like divorced dudes who are bitter and angry or dudes who call themselves pickup artists. I'm like, yeah, I don't believe that. I spilled water on myself. I'll complete the aesthetic. Like it'd be nice if there was just like a married dude that had a happy marriage who just gave advice. I'd do it as a public service. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to count the hours in case they ever have a judgment against me. I try to argue. I've done all this public service already. Let me go, judge. All right. You're going to need a saw because the saw is for getting through bone. This, this saw is badass. This saw will sail through bone. And although I don't exemplify it very well, I got this little video here of me going through it. That is through a spine. Like, I am going down the middle of a spine in this video. All right? That is, uh, by the way, that is his rib section. So I've cut off the area just before his uh, his arms and just at, like just before his legs. So I got the loin area and prior to, you know, the, the front hocks. So this is just rib cage. This is where your rack of lamb comes from and all that stuff. And I'm over here and, and I'm having a lot of trouble because my cutting board is sliding around. That's my excuse. See if you like it. Oh, no, I missed. Screw it. Whoa, what's going on? You can... Man, every time Microsoft updates its stuff, and I don't know what the heck's going on anymore. There's the murder scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Get towards the end of it. Yeah, yeah. Like, takes a like look. That's a that is a spinal column in half. I'm cutting a spine in half with a saw, and it's once you've got a good work surface, which that's the like the biggest lesson I've taken from all this is your biggest challenge is going to be just ergonomics. Like my left hand is the left hand I'm using to hold this thing steady is so much more tired than my right hand. My right hand could go all day and don't make a joke of that. My left hand, however, is freaking tired. And there you go. Bada bing, bada boom. You got a rack of lamb. I love that. I love that. Look at that. I was pretty proud of that. And by the way, my, I could definitely tell you that my lamb was not hungry and he was not starving because there's a lot of fat on this guy. I've never seen marbling on a lamb like this. So there you go. Anyways. Yeah. So, uh, you want your saw, your saw will get you through the bone. Your boning knife will get the meat off the bone. And, uh, your boning knife is really sharp, by the way. Uh, if I could afford it, I would buy chain link gloves like they have at butcher shops. Those are like a hundred dollars a pair, but it's a lot cheaper than losing a finger, right? <laughs> okay. There's the bony knife, Victronics. There's the hooks. I didn't use these. I would say they're optional. If you want to stay sanitary, I would say get them. They're 12 bucks even now. Like when I bought them, how much were they? They're the same price, actually. Their price hasn't gone up. So don't feel like you're getting burned. This price, however, did go up a lot. This was 
$43 when I bought it. And now it's like 64. Because I love my math. If I pop her in your, uh, I said 69 earlier. Dude, I'm telling you, Amazon gets screwed with its prices. It likes to, uh, changes prices per your geography. It changes prices based on your cookies. It changes prices based on a lot of things. I don't like it. It's, it's this, this son of a, I wish there was just a haggle button. It was like, this is how much I'm willing to pay. And then like a week later, be like, all right, fine. We'll, we'll let you pay it. Yeah. Exact, almost exactly 50%, 50.0, uh, 50.5%. Um, or 505 basis points, <laughs> a markup on this since I bought it a year ago, July 10th, 2021. So a year and a few months. Uh, inflation's real. Get the equipment you want now. I love this knife. It sails through it. I didn't use it on this butchery, uh, but this is great for taking the legs off of a, uh, oh yeah, Greg Judy is great, man. Greg Judy, well, Greg Judy's, uh, that makes me feel better, Eugene, because Greg Judy knows what he's talking about. He's one of the guys I really respect on YouTube. And, uh, if he's doing it, it's probably a good idea. Um, I would say if I were you guys, I would buy, like probably next year, I'm going to buy um, some kind of heifer or steer that I can raise here. Something that's just, it's just been bottle weaned and I can feed it hay. And like cows take about two years, I think, to raise. You can slaughter them after one year, but that means I got one winter in which I have to provide him hay. It would be better Oh yeah, Eugene. I'm sorry. My internet connection sucks. Sorry about that, Eugene. Yeah. The, um, the like amount of hay that you need to feed a cow. That's something that's interesting. It's going to be part of the cost. If you can make your own hay, uh, then that's even better, right? Mixed grass. I bought mixed grass hay this year. Last year I bought alfalfa. Alfalfa is really expensive and it's really hard to grow. Um, mixed grass hay, a lot better. Um, in terms of cost, we'll see if it's better in terms of keeping them fat. Uh, but if you can avoid, uh, paying for hay, all the better. Although I will say that according to my sources, hay prices are going down and they're going to keep going down. So I don't know if they're going to keep going down myself. That's not my opinion, but that's what, that's what I've been hearing. I don't believe anything, right? All right. So next thing you need a gamdrill. If I go way back in my photos and I don't know why this thing doesn't let me go like back more. This is a gam drill, all right? So the feet go in these loops right here. The feet go in those loops right there and it'll the weight will actually like pinch on it and it'll stay in. I'll show you a picture of it here in a second. There we go, yeah, yeah, so there it is, there it is. All right, so that gam drill right there is not very expensive and it's got a pretty heavy weight limit according to this, 550 pounds. That's not enough for a cow, but it's enough for just about every domestic animal like goat. Um, sheep, whatever that's below that. All right. So if I pop over here after that, I got my winch. My winch is shown right here. So I have attached this uh, four by four to my wall. I just go ahead and crank this guy up and down. It works great. And let's get to the killing. So to kill this sheep, we use the 22 long rifle. Uh, we used a Ruger. My wife took the scope off of it. All you got to do is get them to eat some food out of a bowl and then shoot them in the forehead. Uh, there's a diagram for it, but it's pretty much where his ears meet in the middle of his eyes. So if you draw a line to the middle of his eyes and you go from the ears, it's going to form a little bit of a triangle right in there is where his brain is. His brain is really small, so you better be good at aiming. However, I say that the uh, slaughtering process, the killing was pretty easy. Uh, once he was down, there we go. There's my wife with the chicken hat and the blue face on. Uh, she, you know, I went ahead and had her uh, slice the throat, which you got to, the, the hair is armor. So you got to part the hair with a knife. And this is the part where it's going to get a little bit more graphic. Um, you got to slit the throat nice and deep. His esophagus and windpipe are way deep in there, but his blood vessels are out a bit. So he'll bleed out pretty good. Let me see if I can get a zoom in on the wound right there. This is after he's been flipped over. So this is the part where he's been like sitting in his own blood for a minute. Oh. All right, there we go. Let's see if I can get a good on his neck. Okay, there's his neck there. It wasn't hard. It was awkward. It was more awkward than difficult, but once you shoot him in the head, his lights are out. He's gone instantly. That's a pretty good way to die. Like, he's going to die some way. In nature, he'd normally be, he would go on. Um, yeah, Manosphere Mondays, Eugene. 
in uh, in nature, he would be torn apart by wolves piece by piece. If you want to go into live leak and look that up, that's his natural alternative. And wolves are not creatures of risk. They're not going to go fight after a male in his prime. They're going to murder the children or they're going to murder the elderly. Killing him right here in his prime is like the best way to do it. He's He's feeling good in his life. He's not decrepit. He doesn't have diseases. He doesn't have like, uh, he's lived long enough to enjoy his life and to breed, which is important. Um, but he's not like filled with diseases and parasites. He's not on his last leg, right? Go ahead and take him out of his prime. It'll be better for him and better for you. Everybody wins. Um, and these animals, they don't really miss each other anyway. As I said before, the rest of his flock doesn't even notice he's gone. Uh, there's my wife about to castrate him or take off the testicles. All right, so we made a little ring around the legs here. And one thing I wished I did is I wished I wrapped some tape around this because his during the whole slaughtering process, those little furs here, little hairs kept falling off and getting on the meat. And that's not sanitary, and it's going to affect the taste. Um, but anyways, yeah, we, we shot him, slit his throat, hoist him up, let him bleed out. And while he's bleeding out, we went ahead and took the uh, collars off his hocks. And there it goes, the process. I didn't have a lot of pictures because I had to put some gloves on and get in there um, and, and help working. So there's going to be like him, he has his skin on, and the next picture his skin's just going to be all off. But pretty much the way you work is you, you take this area here, this little, little valley here, and you take off the skin, you delaminate the skin, and then you start pulling it off like a glove. Because the only thing that's holding that skin onto the rest of his body is connective tissue. And connective tissue is easily delaminated. Uh, if you've ever like worked really hard with a shovel or an axe and you've got a blister, congratulations, you've just delaminated your skin. That's exactly what that is, right? And our bodies, when they're alive, can recover from that. They can rebuild that delamination. Obviously, he's dead. It's not going to work. And we're a lot faster than the healing process with our slaughtering process. So even if he was alive, you know, hope he doesn't. Um, it, we're going to be able to move a lot faster. So we're pretty much just delaminating his skin. You get in there. You, you get between the You pull the skin away. You, you, get, you shove your hand in there. I once knew a girl who was a Ph.D. in anthropology at, at Johns Hopkins. And part of her job was she had to instruct the students on autopsies and she said you kind of rub the human body a little bit get the fat liquefied a little bit and shove your hand under there and just delaminate it that way everybody's got a technique i think i'm going to clamp fishing weights to this guy and let the the weight do all the pulling for me next time because again ergonomics is the most important part of just about any task any manual task and let the weight hold it pull it down for me and i'm just going to be in there with like a spatula or something just like delaminating skin that way i can focus on delamination and let the the weight pull it down anyways here's a bucket full of testicles and a tail yeah they were in the way as you can see that it's it's prominent the testicles are prominent okay this guy must be italian next one all right so uh there's his penis it's it's also prominent it's also in the way you make a nice slit down my wife made a slit all the way down. I suggest taking the slit all the way down to the neck. Okay, some people like to pull them off like a tube. Maybe it's better to take it off like a vest. I've got one more lamb I need to slaughter, so I'm going to refine the process a little bit um, with my wife's suggestions. And here we go. Take the skin off. Again, wrap these hawks, these hoofs, with some tape to keep the fur on. I don't care if you need to put freaking hairspray on it but like that hair was just like kind of sprinkling down the whole process it was it was hell and then as i said before we go from like here's a sheep with skin on it and then boom all the skin's off we pulled it all off so i finally picked up my camera here you can see the sheep no skin uh the esophagus and windpipe have uh come free from the neck meat uh, the neck meat is huge actually if you ever go feel a sheep it's got massive neck meat it's really good for making soups people don't like to eat it as a steak i understand that I haven't eaten it yet, but lamb soup and lamb stew is pretty good too, so we'll take it. Um, from there, we're going to go ahead and make an incision here, bring that incision down all the way to the ribs, and then the guts kind of just fall out, and you're going to have to get in there with two gloves and really just, again, it's just connective tissue, you delaminate. So you've delaminated the outside, and now you got to delaminate the inside. If you've removed the esophagus and windpipe, the connective tissue from this side, it'll all just come out. Um, Here's a fun evolutionary fact. I don't like PBS Eons because it's got that weird pansy looking guy. Um, 
uh, Green, Hank Green. I don't like that guy. He looks like a tiny lesbian. Anyway, Hank Green is on there, whatever. He doesn't do this video though. If you look about how we all evolved from worms, uh, it's about bilateral symmetry and about axial structure. Every single animal is kind of like a worm with legs or a worm with fins. It starts the mouth and it ends at the anus and there's just guts in between. And the thing is our guts kind of ride inside of that like a mech suit. So this whole like meat thing, the thing that we're actually interested in is just sort of the muscular suit that contains, protects, and mobilizes all of our guts. We're just worms in meat suits. And we want that meat suit, so we gotta get the worm out, right? We gotta pull all this stuff out. And once you do, the carcass is pretty much totally separate from all the guts. Um, here's my cooler. I thought I rotated it. Yeah, so here's my cooler. Once, we've, uh, once you have the carcass up and you've removed all the guts, you got to age it for a day at 45, uh, sorry, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. There we go. At 40 degrees Fahrenheit, freaking Sargon Avocado just popped up on my phone. All right. So here he's in a cooler. We have to age him. It's not like steak. Steak has to get aged for a long time. Lamb really only needs to get aged about as long as a chicken does. So which is 24 hours at a, at a cool temperature, not freezing, but cool. So I put him in a cooler. Uh, there's the crime scene. This is where he was hanging. There's where the blood was. Notice I used the tarp underneath. I highly suggest that. That kept a lot of the uh, waste out. And you'll notice there's the skin in the bottom there. So just a, a tube of skin there. I put the skin in a garment bag and then vacuum sealed it. I don't know if I'm going to spring the money to have it tanned, but I figured I'd freeze it and then weigh my options. Um, and there, by the way, is a leg of lamb. Now notice that's a six inch blade with about a four inch handle. And that's how big that leg of lamb is. There's a, a DeWalt miter saw behind it for scale. I mean, I, I should have just held some uh, a tape measure next to it, but look at that. That's its, that's its hind leg. That is a massive amount of meat. Here's the rest of the meat in there, ice, everything. Here's me cutting into the leg portions. So I'm making uh, a leg of lamb steaks right here. I'm just cutting through with my chef's knife. Uh, I use a uh, Case X, Case X uh, chef knife, eight inch long. Uh, I think I got it for like 60 bucks. No, 40 bucks. It was cheap, actually. So those Kamikoto knives they try to sell, those scam on YouTube. Uh, KSX knives is the real deal. Made in Pennsylvania. Um, very sharp, excellent spring steel. Made in, again, made in Pennsylvania. Obviously, last I checked, Pennsylvania is in America. So you're supporting a nice American business. Uh, it's inexpensive, 30, 40 bucks. And it's a great knife. Sharpens well. That's what you want. Yeah, so I started bringing this stuff in and I watched the uh, Bearded Butcher video on how to chop this guy apart. Um, I'm not here to tell you how to chop it apart. Bearded Butchers will do a good job. I cut a lot of corners because Bearded Butcher are proper butchers. They're making retail cuts. I don't do retail cuts. I do me cuts. I will stick this whole thing into an Instant Pot and just let her go, throw some rosemary in there, throw some, uh, I don't know, throw some brown sugar. I don't know what goes well with it. <laughs> and go to town, you know? So there we go. There we go. Yeah, so I got ribs out of that. Here's me. The ribs. There's ribs. It's got a membrane on there. You can use the chef's hook to uh, remove the membrane. Again, Bearded Butcher has a good video on that. Here's the front portion right there. Uh, I use a tub full of ice to let, it, let the portion sit. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't say this. I cut the sheep into three parts. Uh, if you were to imagine it on your body, imagine just above your legs at your waist and just around your armpit where your arms start. And that's where I cut it. So there you go. Um, it makes it much more manageable and you got to cut it that way anyway. There's me looking through. There we go. <laughs> Again, we're just, it's just a worm, right? It's just a big tube. We're all tubular beings. A fire, but mostly peaceful shooting. Is that the end of my camera roll? It might very well be. Yeah, it might be. All right. So that was fun. And from that, that is the, pretty much the long and short of it. I bought land. If you got land, that's great. I bought some sheep, some seed sheep, which means sheep, like a breeding set. Breeding set is a ram and two oos. It's pronounced oo. I thought it was ew, and every farmer thought I was a freaking moron, which they're not wrong, but, you know, anyways, it doesn't feel good to just give it away all, all the beginning. You got to tease out the moron. You got to let them find out that you're a moron over time. Uh, you can't just give it away instantly, right? 
Uh, gun without the gunshot. Oh, yeah, yeah, Joey Diener. You could probably do it. Now, you can get a, yourself a captive bolt pistol. Okay, it depends on how squeamish you are. Depends on how squeamish you are. But you can use a captive bolt pistol. A captive bolt pistol, if you've ever seen No Country for Old Men, that's pretty much what he was using. <laughs> uh, and it, it can be run with uh, compressed air or a charge or like... I don't know, like a pullback mechanism. There we go. Where's the uh, Butcher Boy, Walk Fear of the Walking Dead? I know it's in, there we go, No Country Fold Men. Yeah, Anton Chigur uses it. Uh, captive bolt pistol is what you want to use. Now, if you're not squeamish, you can just get in there and slit its throat yourself. I have a lot of trouble with that, man. I mean, it's, animals are not humans. Um, animals are not privy to the same moral rules that we have for ourselves and i would really caution against empathizing too much with animals because they certainly don't empathize with you um they don't empathize with each other again as i said the sheep herd walked past a shed with the lamb in it the lamb was like bleeding out like saying hey help me hey where is everybody and the herd just walked by like it wasn't there like we don't care like psh, we don't need to know you that's cold man they, they haven't missed him at all. They don't even care, right? So anyways, but but we cannot help but empathize with other creatures. That's what makes us human. That's what makes humans great, that we empathize with things that don't really deserve empathy. I mean, we can all kind of relate to that. A lot of us don't deserve a lot of the things that we have, um, but we still give them, and we still get them, right? So I find a captive bolt pistol. It's The, the process is called stunning. And what it does is it sort of instantly puts the lights out. Now, I've bled out before. Uh, when I was a kid, at four years old, I slit my tendons in my leg. And I ended up bleeding out until the uh, hospital got me. It was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Because I was sitting there conscious the whole time as I'm, like, losing my faculties. I'm, I can't feel my legs. I feel cold. I, you know, and eventually your mind starts to go, like, I don't, rem I don't know what day of the week it is. I don't know who I am. I don't know what my age is. I don't know who anyone around me is. It's like, I'd, be, I'd rather just go and like, boom, it's gone. So captive bull pistol is what you want to use. Yeah, here it is. There we go. This is what I'm talking about. Compressed air, spring mechanism with a discharge by a blank round, ignited by a firing pin. You could use either one, any one of these. It's going to make it a lot easier on you. That's right. I don't, like, there's a lot of things we do that's inhuman, we would say is inhumane right to animals like it's not humane to kill a human and eat him right but it is a it is okay to do it with an animal um that's where the empathy kind of ends um but we still have some sort of rules right we, we don't want the reason why we don't want ant to make su animals suffer at our own hand is not because of what it does to the animal but because of what it does to you um you know don't, don't be so cold-hearted i hope you don't ever slit 